Okay, good morning. So my name is Emilio Artacho, as you can see in the slides. And uh, I will be introducing the Siesta code. Uh, it's going to be mostly generalities about it, defining it. There will be other lectures later with more details on particular aspects of it. So let me start, if I, let me see. So first, uh, what the whole thing is about. So Siesta, probably as you know it, is um, a quite, a, quite a well-known and relatively standard density functional theory based uh, code for first principle simulations of um, different kinds of systems. It was uh, born with an ambition of efficiency and uh, it is meant to be uh, quite efficient and, and fast for large systems, efficient in terms of CPU and memory. And uh, it was born uh, with uh, linear scaling, we will see a little bit about that, linear scaling features so that one can do calculations that scale only linearly with system with system size and being the number of atoms or the number of electrons. And so, and also because of some of its characteristics, intrinsic characteristics, it can go to highly accurate if one increases uh, basis set uh, well enough, uh, but uh, also one can do quite uh, quick qualitative calculations. So that's the from quick and dirty to highly accurate. Um, it is based on uh, using non-conserving pseudopotentials. You know everything about it after the first couple of days of the school. So I'm not going to say anything about them. And I'm going to say a bit about the other key component, which is uh, that it is based on a basis of atomic orbitals. Um, and then for the calculation of matrix elements, we will be using a grid. In other contexts, it is the same thing that you may have heard from other codes that use plane waves as auxiliary basis is the same idea. And uh, we will see a little bit about these linear scaling capabilities. Here, I'm going to introduce the very basic, basic commonalities of the code. There are many more things that the code can do than the ones I'm going to be mentioning here. Uh, some of those you're going to be hearing in, in, in the lectures to come. But let's start from the very beginning. So I like to always think of in terms of the kinds of things we do as the physics of low energy matter. So we're going to be dealing with electrons and nuclei. So low energy in the sense that we're not going to see within a nucleus. For us, electrons and nuclei are going to be elementary particles, point-like particles. And that includes lots of different contexts uh, within atomic molecular physics, but also condensed matter physics, materials, plasma, and even some um, so enormous conditions of, of pressure and temperature can be reached with, uh, with this technique. So it's, it's really a very, very versatile world. Uh, the one we can deal with uh, within Siesta as with other DFT codes. So that's the context. And of course, uh, we're going to aim for doing first principles, meaning that we're going to be starting from quantum mechanics. Here you have two of the key people, Heisenberg and Schrodinger. You have the Schrodinger equation as the key equations that we're going to be facing, uh, written there nicely. I, I haven't tried, but can you see the pointer there when I move it? Yeah, okay. So, and... Uh, and that would be the Schrodinger equation with a Hamiltonian operator here, which is written very, very simply in terms of a kinetic energy term that looks like this in quantum mechanics. And the rest is just Coulomb's law, the attraction and repulsion by, by point charges. That's everything actually we need for non-relativistic quantum mechanics. We will be considering the inclusion of relativistic corrections as well, and SISTA can do that, but I'm not going to mention anything uh, on that here. Otherwise, this is what we're facing. It seems simple, but it is not. It is just nuclei, nuclei and electrons. And essentially, uh, let me go back to this very famous quote by Paul Dirac. Uh, once these things were established, uh, everything was already there, but the exact application of these laws leads to equations much too complicated to be soluble. So essentially, most of the last hundred years in this context, or in many contexts in physics, have been uh, gone into how to approximate the solutions to those equations. That is the 
the basic background. And now let's start with the very fundamental approximations. Of course, most of the things people will be doing with siesta are going to be based on the adiabatic approximation, or not not quite the same thing, but uh, qualitatively the same thing as the born open heart approximation, uh, in which just using the fact that the masses of nuclei and electrons are so different, one can think that in equilibrium, uh, nuclei are going to be move, moving much more slowly than electrons. And so we have here a cartoon. This is the same system we're facing with electrons and nuclei moving about all together under the mutual interactions and following quantum mechanics. We're going to split the problem into two, one of them in which we're going to see the electrons moving for fixed positions of nuclei and then see what would the, the dynamic of the nuclei would be once um, under the effective interactions mediated by those electrons. Um, we're going to be concentrating mostly on the first bit here. And there will be other things in the workshop that may be uh, looking at what can you think, uh, what can you do once you know, for instance, the forces among the nuclei due to the electrons. So you can do molecular dynamics, relaxation, structural prediction, many things with that. But for the time being, I'm going to concentrate on the kinds of things we do to solve the very first bit. Uh, just to say in parenthesis that, of course, there are among the many other things that Siesta can do, Siesta can also do time-dependent evolution of electrons, which would be clearly beyond this approximation. So in which you solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation instead of the time-independent one. But I'm not going to get into that. So density functional theory, that would be the way we were going to tackle the still very uh, problematic uh, system of having many electrons in quantum mechanics. It's a, it's a problem we know that it has exponential complexity. So we need an exponential, exponentially growing uh, resources in CPU and memory uh, to deal with uh, any number, with a given number of electrons that grows. And so density functional theory is a, approximate, it's a theory, which is an exact theory on which we can build approximations that are very manageable. And it is, as pr you probably already know, just very briefly, based on a couple of building blocks. The first one is the fundamentals of the theory in which, uh, in the hohenberg cohn theorems, there was a mapping, or there was a, a, yeah, essentially for the ground state, I'm going to talk about the ground state theory, the variational principle that you can find in conventional quantum mechanics, the energy as a functional of the uh, many-body wave function, can be uh, translated into a theory in which we have a functional, the energy as a functional of the single particle or one particle density, which is this lowercase n here. And so that allows one to go, to go away from this exponential complexity problem. But then in a second step that we're going to be using, uh, this minimization of this energy functional, which uh, we will have to approximate, so the energy functional, the fu as a function of density, will be an approximate uh, functional. We don't know the exact form of it. But in addition to that, the way of dealing with this minimization problem will be by uh, turning the problem, the fixed nuclei, but dynamically moving, so the electrons, quantum mechanical electrons around it, trans transforming this problem to a problem of fixed nuclei and a, an electron moving in an effective bath of the other electrons. Uh, it is a self-consistent single particle problem, a mean field like problem, the very same as you would get in a Hartree-Fock theory, which is the, the conventional many, uh, mean field theory for, um, for electrons. So then, Within this second uh, uh, way, this effective one particle problem, we have what we call Korn Sham DFT because of the authors of that proposal, Korn Sham density functional theory, in which we will have this Korn Sham Hamiltonian, a single particle Hamiltonian, kinetic energy for one single electron, the external potential due to the presence of the nuclei. Then we have the hard tree potential, which is written here that depends directly on the electron density. And that hard tree potential gives you the uh, main, um, so the interaction between any electron and the particle density in the cloud of the other electrons taking the, the particle density as such. So it is 
Uh, this would be the R3 um, term as a potential. And in addition, we have an exchange correlation potential that uh, contains everything else, everything that I'm uh, missing that, keep, that would give you the uh, potential, the exact potential or the potential that would give you a, a solution that then will give you the exact energy and density. And that potential following the theory is nothing but the functional derivative of the energy as a, dens as a function of the density, uh, the functional derivative with respect to density itself. Once we have this Hamiltonian, the idea is to solve that Hamiltonian in a Schrodinger-like equation, but now it's an equation for one particle at a time. And then when we solve this on this, uh, this constant potential, what we need to do is we will have all these energy levels, single particle energy levels, and we have to occupy them in the usual way with the Aufbau principle, as you would do with any single particle effective theory. And uh, out of that, you will get um, uh, everything. In Hartree-Fock, you would get, by occupying them, you would get a Slater determinant wave function. Instead of that, here, the only thing you need is actually the density, which is recovered by this sum over the uh, Consham states that have been obtained before. So that is the framework. Then the approximations, of course, as proposed by Korn and Sham even initially, the local density approximation would be the starting point in which for any system with any density, the exchange correlation potential would be related to the interaction of the energy that of the electron that we are con considering with the exchange correlation hole around that electron. And so we are mapping this problem into a better known problem of the same the exchange correlation hole for the same density of the density at that point, but assuming that the density is a constant. So that would be for the homogeneous electron liquid for which we have reference calculations and we know what the exchange correlation potential and the exchange correlation energy would be. And out of that, we get everything we need uh, following the procedure that I just outlined. One can generalize it to gradients with the GGAs in which the potential depends on the density and the gradient of the density. And one can go beyond that one that uh, was actually in a mathematical form that was quite pioneered in uh, within Siesta, at least from the point of view of efficient calculations, you can do Van der Waals exchange correlation functionals in which the exchange correlation potential depends on the density and the gradient of the density at, at any two points in space, not only at a single point. Okay, so now let me go to some of the peculiarities of siesta. Siesta is based on expanding your Kohn-Sham eigenstates in a basis set. Well, that's always going to be the case, but in this case, it's going to be an atomic-like basis set. So, but generally, it is first. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, the basis set. Uh, let me start by generalities. If we have a set of single particle wave functions. The wave functions would look like this in the in abstract terms in Dirac space would be these kets. So the Schrodinger equation that we're Schrodinger like, the Kohn-Sham equation we're trying to solve is uh, this one here. If you introduce expansions of your Kohn-Sham eigenstates in terms of the basis and coefficients, then and introduce these two matrices, the overlap matrix and the Hamiltonian matrix, then the Schrodinger-like equation becomes uh, this eigen, eigen, generalized eigen equation here. Okay, Maria, you should uh, mute yourself. And then um, you have here, we have introduced the fact that the, the possibility is that uh, the basis is non-orthogonal. So this S matrix is the matrix of all the scalar products of wave functions in the, in the basis. One, one thing we're going to be using within density functional theory is the fact that the density, particle density is a, cru a crucial component. We wrote it like this before in terms of the sum of the squares of the occupied Consham states. And actually, if one introduces the expansion, this expansion that I was introducing before in terms of the basis and follow it through, you get that the density can be expressed in terms of a matrix here in terms of the basis states, that it is what is called the density matrix 
end products of uh, the the basis wave functions. So the basis, the density matrix is the sum over all occupied states of the coefficients. Uh, um, put it in in this way, in this row mu nu is the density matrix. In some places you will see it as dm. Okay, so actually here you see it as dm. Um, let me then uh, illustrate how uh, this will go in siesta and similar codes. Um, the whole um, way of working of the code, you can see it as made of a cycling, self-consistent field cycling, the SCF cycle, in which in each one of the steps you will have two different steps. So let's start the calculation by having atomic positions that define the external potential. And out of these atomic positions, we start with an, in, with an input density matrix, a gas density matrix. When we start a calculation, we can consider that the density matrix would be the one that corresponds to having atomic-like densities for each one of the atoms. So as neutral atoms, and we put neutral atoms in their initial positions. Having the, this density matrix, we can build the matrix, the density in space, the real, the particle density, and with atomic positions, we can also go directly and build the um, the um, overlap matrix. And from the density, we build the Hamiltonian. So there will be a first step, which I'm going to call building, which is calculating the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian, the conscient Hamiltonian, and the overlap. And then a second step would be solving. Once we have solved, we can obtain the density matrix again, that would be dm out. And if these two things, these two dms are different, we cycle, we go back. And we cycle until the two density matrices are sufficiently equal. They are not going to be exactly the same. That would be infinite effort. But uh, within some tolerance, we find that the difference between in and out is within uh, is acceptable. Once that happens, out of that, we have the results. And we can obtain whatever we need, forces, energy structures, uh, band structures, etc. I'm not going to go much into that. Now, as I said, Siesta was initially built with an ambition of locality, of, uh, sorry, efficiency. And for that, linear scaling was a key component. And linear scaling, the fact that the computational effort is going to be proportional to the number of atoms that I have, is something that uh, stems directly from uh, locality. If we manage to speak locally, uh, then we can get, and, and, and we code things appropriately, we can get to uh, an approximation which is uh, scaling linearly in, with system size. And that can be illustrated simply with this cartoon. Imagine that we have a system which is large. It doesn't need to be green or, or square, but large. Imagine that uh, we could um, think of it in terms of little, of smaller building blocks, and out of these building blocks, imagine that we can actually consider one block at a time uh, by solving whatever it is in the block and maybe in some environment of the block. If we can do that for every block, and then we go through the sequence of all the blocks in my system, they could be atoms, molecules, sets of atoms, whatever it is, but local environments, if we do that, then it is relatively easy to see that if I now double the size of the system, the, system, the effort is doubled because I have twice as many blocks. And the uh, working of any of the blocks does not interfere with blocks far away. So as long as I can have things that can be confined to environments of entities in real space, this locality, then uh, we can get to uh, linear scaling operations. That was pioneered by Wei Tao Yang, in the very early 90s with uh, his uh, divide and conquer method, and then later formalized uh, the conditions for this work formalized by Walter Kohn in with his nearsightedness principle. But uh, I'm not going to say much about that, but except to, to show what kind of things in Siesta make that possible. So um, let me now uh, mention a bit about the basis from the point of view of what we need for your understanding um, um, how Siesta works, the basics of the basis. There will be more on basis later on, but essentially we're going to be using numerical pseudo-atomic orbitals uh, 
So they are LCAO, that's the chemical way of talking about basis of atomic orbitals. Essentially, they are wave functions for one single particle that can be factorized in terms of a radial wave function with respect to a center, typically a nucleus, and an angular component in when you speak in spherical coordinates. These angular components within siesta are using the real version of the um, spherical harmonics. And so we have the typical SPC, SPD shells and so on and so forth. And uh, the, another key component in terms of what I just mentioned about this locality for linear scaling, we're going to use finite support atomic orbital. So the angular shapes will be the familiar ones you know since uh, uh, child care, essentially, the S, the P's, the D's, the F's. And uh, that's the angular momentum. But for the radial shape, uh, we have some freedom there. They will be the, we're going to be using the eigenstates of the pseudopotential. So that's reason for talking about pseudoatoms. So we solve the pseudo, an isolated atom with the pseudopotential, and that will give you wave functions that are going to be um, uh, the pseudoatom wave functions. And here you have an illustration of what would be the normal one, the one that extends with a tail. This is just an example, but you can confine them and we're going to use finite support. Finite support means that the basis function we're going to be using, they go strictly to zero at some cutoff radius. Uh, you can have a hard, hard confinement in which it goes to zero in a way. So I lost my, it goes to zero in a way that it can have a little kink at the end, or you can make it infinitely smooth. At the, at the cutoff radius with smooth confinement. So we're going to be using that. And, uh, but let me just make uh, very clear, very, very clear what siesta requires. The conditions to use siesta from the point of view of the basis are two. They have to be atomic-like in the sense that they are factorized in terms of a radial function and angular momentum components, so like that, and they have to be finite of finite range. The rest is up to the user. So how many centers you put is up to you. You can put them on the atoms, that's a conventional thing, but you could put as an array of Bessel functions put somewhere in space, covering the whole of space with Bessel functions that are not on the atoms, for instance. Or you can put them on the atoms and somewhere else as well. Um, you, can, you can choose how many you want. You can choose where you put them on the atoms or not. You can choose how many uh, shells of angular momentum you put, how many different radial shapes for e each one of the angular momentum channels, and you can choose the shape of the radial shape of the radial function. Um, we are going to show, or oh, you will see some proposals. So uh, people using Siesta, they don't need to uh, have basis sets and radial shapes in their pockets to use, but you're free to use uh, whichever you want. And here I have an example. If you wanted to, you could use a radial shape like this. I'm not recommending it either for efficiency or for accuracy, but even this radial shape is allowed. So the user can define their own radial shape as long as it is of finite support as uh, this one. Okay, here are some uh, more realistic examples. You will be seeing in the next lecture about multiple zeta. So that means for the same angular momentum channel, for the same S-like shape or the P-like shape, you can have more than one function in this case. And that would be, this is an example of a double zeta, in which you have these two quite similar radial shapes, but corresponding to two different orbitals that then the system will have the freedom to linearly combine in whatever way it finds uh, suitable. Um, they can be built in different ways and defined in different ways, but you will hear about that later. Uh, there will be also polarization orbitals. That means if you start from the, uh, from the isolated atom with some valence states, you can introduce angular momentum channels that would not be occupied in the atom, but would be needed to describe uh, the flexibility, the angular flexibility you would need in an environment which is not the atomic one, so in the presence of other nuclei, in a solid or in a molecule. So this one example of, this is one of the 
phase that Siesta that you can see uh, produced by Siesta, in which this would be, for instance, a double Zeta P basis. So double Zeta 2 per angular momentum channel plus a polarization. For sodium chloride, in sodium, you would have the S here, you have two S for the valence, remember, two for the S orbitals, that's double Zeta, and one shell of P orbitals. And for the for the chlorine, you have two for the S orbitals, two shells for the P's, and one shell for the D. That would be the situation for the sodium chloride signal system. Well, anyway, not uh, you will see everything about high hierarchies, single zeta, double zeta, triple zeta, single zeta P, double zeta P polarized, triple zeta polarized, triple zeta doubly polarized. And you can see how things converge in this case would be the total energy in a silicon atom and how it compares with plane waves. You can get to plane wave convergence with, if you put enough uh, basis sets. Remember that although sometimes among uh, solid state physicists, uh, atomic orbitals would have um, uh, would be not so welcome as plane waves sometimes. Remember that one of the golden um, um, one of the reference systems for highly correlated, so for high accuracy, for correlated systems beyond DFT would be the ones from quantum chemistry, which are based on atomic orbitals as basis sets. So essentially they go down this route until they get enough convergence. So uh, going back then to the calculations themselves, remember the two cycles, that, so the two steps in each cycle, let me go and tell you a little bit how the building of the matrix elements goes, because it's, it affects a little bit how to think in terms of what you're using within Siesta. So here we have, again, the Concham Hamiltonian. And let me say first what we do with long range. You will have electrostatics, the electron nuclei attraction, that's this term here, the electron-electron repulsion that would appear in the R3 potential here. Sorry for the change in nomenclature. I'm using a bit of a mix of slides. But anyway, these two things are long range. One of the tricks we used in Siesta is that we start with, uh, we consider the atomic, free, the, uh, the density of the free atom, that's the one I'm going to talk about. So yeah, the density of the free atom, this is this row not of R. So if you consider the hard tree repulsion due to the density of one single atom in its spherical, uh, with its spherical density, and the electron attraction from the same nucleus, the sum of these two terms uh, for one isolated atom is an atomic potential, a radial potential, which is um, uh, perfectly confined within the size of the atom. It is short range. So by adding them up, the attractive term and the repulsive term this way, we're killing the long range in an interesting way. We'll have the long range of whatever the hard tree, actually the term, the real hard tree term for the real density. So the hard tree potential to the actual density is going to be, of course, long range, but that will be this deformation only that enters uh, in the, into the equations, because that would be the difference between the true den hard tree potential minus the hard tree potential due to this spherical atoms. And so then using that, we can rewrite things in terms of this, in terms of the same things, the kinetic energy, the non-local part of the zero potential. We'll see a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, the, the neutral atom potential, which is the short range one, uh, this delta uh, R3 and the exchange correlation. We're going to be doing things, two different ways of calculating matrix elements, the two center integrals, very, very cheap things that we're going to be doing in a particular way. And the rest is going to go to a discretization in real space. So for the two central integrals here, it is illustrated what we do it for the other matrix you have to compute, which is the overlap matrix, which is the simplest one to compute. It is obviously two centers because it is based on the product, scalar product of two basis functions, which at most it is centered in two different centers, atoms or not. And so this overlap will be, can be written in terms of this, which capital R is the vector joining these two centers. And uh, one can see that an integral like that using a convolution theorem of Fourier theory, you can express it if you do the Fourier transform 
of your orbitals, this uh, overlap is just this full, the uh, Fourier transform back of the products of the Fourier transforms of the original basis functions. The same thing can be done with the kinetic energy term and with a non-local part of pseudopotential. Pseudopotentials in principle would be three term, three uh, center integrals because you have the two orbitals and the atom with the pseudopotential that could be on three different atoms, for instance. But if the non-local part, which is written like this, actually you can see that when I, whenever I close it with two orbitals uh, to make a matrix element out of that, we, you're going to have a scalar product on one side and another scalar product on the other, and they are both two center integrals. So they can be done with the same technology. This is extremely cheap, cheap to do. It is actually all of the possible integrals like this are calculated at the very beginning of the calculation of siesta as a function of distance and stored in tables and they are looked up later. So it is really, it is almost as having them analytically. And uh, this is um, the, no, the, non, the local part of the potential, which is the one we called ion potential before that goes, that's the one that has the long range asymptotics. Uh, that's not included into the uh, into the two center integrals, and then the rest, the b, um, would be all the other all the other terms that would include the exchange correlation, the, the Hartree term for the density for the density for the deformation density, um, etc. All these terms are going to be calculated on a real space grid. So this is a two dimensional cartoon. So you take space. Uh, discretize it, and here you would have the finite support region, for instance, for two different orbitals. If you're calculating a matrix element between the two. Essentially, you will be needing to evaluate whatever you're evaluating, like the exchange correlation potential, for instance, within the list of points within this. And dealing with lists of points and, uh, mat and uh, the matrix elements calculated for the different orbitals, allows you to, to work everything out in terms of sparse matrices, and that will give you linear scaling operations for your calculations. And so uh, the delta, the deformation density we're talking about before for the Poisson equation, that's the only one which is not based on locality. Uh, the fact that that can be done uh, uh, in linear scaling would be because of smoothness, not because of locality. We normally do it with fast Fourier transform, which is not strictly linear scaling. It is n log n, but it is extremely uh, efficient and it is a ridiculously small bit of the calculation of any siesta calculation. So we haven't had any pressure to change it to linear scaling, although there are options for solving this in linear scaling operations. And so essentially, you get from the density, fast Fourier transform into the density in the reciprocal space, then uh, it's trivial to get the Poisson equation of there, like this, it's just dividing by g squared, and then fast Fourier transform back, and you get your Hartree potential in real space in all the points of the grid. And uh, is similarly, you can do, you can work on all the points of the grid on the GGA potentials, I'm not going to get into any of these things. This is discretized. Uh, so discretize the calculation of, for instance, of the gradient in, um, in uh, essentially like this. So this can be done. And there is a whole library that has been sprung out of Siesta, which is called grid XC, which is ways of calculating all these things within a discretized grid of real space. All these things are done in real space. Once you get to solve these things, then of course it will depend, the quality of the calculations will depend on uh, how fine is your grid, because essentially um, you, you will be able to describe up to functions with this kind of periodicity. And uh, this describing the, 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 the fineness of the grid can be done in a language which is very similar to, or essentially the same language as plane waves. So this delta X, which is how distance are the different points of the grid, can be related to a cutoff, a length, a cutoff in reciprocal space, which would be pi over delta x. And so just the kinetic energy associated to that Kc 
gives you the plane wave cutoff, which is com uh, which is corresponding to that grid. So when people talk about uh, plane waves uh, as auxiliary basis, is using a grid with a plane wave cutoff cutoff that it is describing this fineness. And again, of course, once you have that, uh, that introduces some uh, as an approximation introduces things that effects that are not quite. Uh, uh, that are related to the approximations, there is an effect that we call the Ekpox effect, which is uh, the rippling of space. Depending on if you have free atom in space, it wouldn't matter where you put it. The energy of the atom would be the same everywhere. But actually, if you do it when a discretization of space like this, it depends where you put the atom with respect to the grid, that there will be an effective, if you want, undulation of the potential it feels a potential that is uh, like putting little balls on, on a net box instead of putting it putting them on a flat table they would uh, there would be this additional then there are ways of dealing with the with the net box effect if you want to deal with that specifically there is an option in siesta which is called grid set, grid cell sampling but essentially uh, the main the main idea is always to increase the plane wave cutoff, so reduce the distance between points in order to get uh, better and better precision for your numbers. And uh, this would be just a typical convergence uh, calculation. Uh, here, actually, it was compared with a plane wave cutoff for a plane wave code, and you get the same kinds of things. So you get errors uh, if you go to too rough a grid or too rough a cutoff for the plane waves. And in the moment you crank up the, the mesh cutoff, which is called in siesta, uh, then you get better and better quality for the numbers. This um, um, egg box effect the, uh, this, it tends to disappear and so on and so forth. The other bit that goes with uh, any solution of a siesta problem is the um, solving it. So we have built a Hamiltonian, now we need to solve. Most people, use siesta by diagonalizing the uh, matrix the matrix that appears just calling a diagonalizing subroutine uh, but uh, uh, let me just mention that there are ways of dealing with that of solving by using linear scaling the traditional way within siesta has been using localized solutions not localized basis in this plot the dark dots are the pseudo potentials the smaller size uh, the uh, middle size things are the basis sets, and the wider ones are the solutions, vanier like solutions of your problem that can be found by minimizing the functional directly, linear scaling functional. And so, with that, you can uh, get to solve everything. If you do diagonalization, then you can uh, and you will do the usual things for a periodic system. You will have to integrate into K in the K space, and you will have. K point sampling, and um, we have the typical one can introduce regular grids. In this would be discretization of reciprocal space now for your bands and for your integrals in K. That's very common to any uh, condensed matter, so solid state physics code. In the first brilliant zone, here you would have, for instance, you would take these points. You can do a more horseback, uh, the more horseback trick in which you displace them with respect to. Uh, this discretization and you avoid high symmetry points and so on. It can be characterized with a length cutoff. It's the same idea, but the other way around from the real space grid. So we'd have a discretization of real space for calculation of integrals, discretization of reciprocal space for integrating in uh, in the brilliant zone. And this one characterized by a length cutoff. Uh, and then you will, fee you will see uh, typical technical things about uh, that needs to be worked out in any uh, solid state physics code. You will have to, to deal with, with self consistency and how to converge it. It's a non trivial problem in many cases. And it, here is illustrated a typical example of a problem that you may have. You have a large metallic system, you can have charge sloshing, in which if you have an extra charge, an accumulation of charge in one end, uh, the energy goes up. And the other end has a, a too little charge of the energy. The attraction for the electrons is such that the energy goes down. So when that happens in the next cycle, the charge accumulates on the other side and the situation reverses. 
and the charge goes back and forth. You know, one has to really uh, crank them with uh, different techniques in order to get these kinds of things under control. That is common to anything. In, we have the typical techniques in siesta. To do that, for instance, we use Poulet mixing, by which the density that you're introducing initially can be stored in, uh, you can keep several uh, in the history of your Poulet density, of your, ma of your matrices, and then mix them up to try to, to guess which one is going to be the next one, instead of just putting in and out, in and out all the time. You do an extrapolation from the last few ones that you know. That would be typical uh, Poulet mixing. Anyway, so these were uh, the kinds of things I wanted just to transmit. Uh, but going back to the very beginning, with these kind of things, you can uh, apply uh, Siesta to all sorts of different things of different contexts. Here you have just a list of some of them that have been in, um, for which Siesta has been used in chemistry. Well, of course, the physics that we were mentioning before, but also chemistry, bio, environments, geo, astro, in engineering, in nanoscience, and, and lots of things. And with this, I finish, and um, I will be happy to answer questions. Uh, and let's jump right into the first tutorial. But first, I want to show you some stuff, which is where the hell are we? Like, uh, if you want to consta, uh, contact people from Siesta or have any kind of issue that you want uh, to share, there are several ways in which you can find us. Of course, with our names, you can Google them and get our emails. But usually, uh, for things related to the science stuff, uh, some of us are active in the Materials Stack Exchange uh, page. If you use the tag Siesta, we will know that you are asking a question about Siesta. And if you have issues with the code or want to see the releases or whatever, uh, we also have the GitLab uh, page. So you can open issues here. Um, we have our main web page, which basically points to all of the places I'm mentioning. And we have the tutorials page, uh, which you will become familiar with it uh, today. Uh, this page has a lot of tutorials and how-tos that we encourage you to do if you want to get deeper into Siesta. Uh, we also have a Discord server, but I don't think the invite is yet on the page, uh, but you eventually you will be able to, to come there and join us uh, there too. Having said that, uh, let me get into the first encounter with Siesta. Okay. This is not fully screening. Now it is. Okay. Uh, so, hello everyone. I don't think I presented myself. I'm Federico Bedran. I'm part of the core maintainers of Siesta. And let me show you around with the first steps with, with Siesta. So, first thing we need to know is how do we run Siesta? Uh, if you want to test yourself things and become more familiar with Siesta outside what we'll be covering in the school, uh, you, we created a source file in this directory that you can source and you will get all of the Siesta tools in your, in your main path. Um, but for the purposes of, the, of this school, we have the files for these days tutorials in this folder here. Um, and within each of the folders, you will find a submission script, a sample submission script, with, uh, all, which already sources this, uh, this Siesta, Siesta RC, and you will have everything on, on that run script. So basically, what you will have to do is uh, to edit that uh, run script for your purposes if you want to, to test other things. Um, you will notice that in our sample script, we use very few CPUs. And today, we will not be using GPUs yet. Um, given that these first tutorials are for you to familiarize with the code and tackle very small systems, using GPUs would be actually detrimental. Uh, part of using accelerators is knowing when not to use them. Um, so you will have to wait until tomorrow uh, with uh, Alberto Stockholm solvers uh, to, to find something about uh, GPUs. 
Uh, in the case of siesta, since as Emilio already said, uh, the main concern is efficiency. Uh, using accelerators that not, does not become relevant until you are talking about hundreds to thousands of atoms. Uh, for smaller scale systems, like a few dozen, you can actually run those in your home PC if you want. Um, so now let, let us have a look at, at the inputs that you will find in Siesta. So for this tutorial, uh, you will head into the first encounter tutorial. I believe this is already on the school page too. So it's available there. And you will have to copy the files in this folder. Uh, and in there, you will find basically what are the two main inputs for a Siesta calculation. What you need to run Siesta, and it's in its most basic form, are the files for the pseudo potential, which can be generated by yourself using the, the atom code, or most usually now, you just download it from the pseudo dojo as a PSML pseudo potential. Uh, and then you need, a, uh, you need an FDF file. The FDF file is the file that contains all of the options that uh, will be relevant for our for our app. Uh, this may include information, the geometry, the atomic species, the level of theory that we want to use, uh, basis sets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I will show you briefly what are the contents for your first FDF file in this tutorial. Uh, the first few lines that you will find are basically the system name and system label. System name is not relevant for the run. It's something for you to uh, catalog or, or classify whatever you are running. But the system li label is important because this means that all of the output files will begin by that label. So we want to have information of the chemical bonds involved. Then you will find those at uh, ch4.bonds. You want to find the energy of uh, a molecular dynamics run. You will find those in the ch4.ene. Uh, so th that's what the system label is used for. More importantly, you will find below the total number of atoms in the simulation box. Here we will be doing methane. So we have four hydrogens and one carbon. That's five atoms. And then the different kinds of atoms or atomic species in the Siesta jargon uh, that in this case, again, you have hydrogen and carbon. You have two different species. Uh, and this uh, number of species should coincide with uh, what you find below in the chemical species label. The, chem the, the chemical species label block uh, has uh, basically three components, which are the, the first index, which is one, two, three, is then the index for the species. Then the atomic number, so six for carbon, one for hydrogen, and then the name. The name is relevant for, for example, the pseudo potential file or the basis files. Uh, if you call this uh, C, uh, then Siesta expects you to find uh, within your same working directory a uh, pseudo potential called C.PSF or .PSML, for example. Um, and well, as I said, the amount of lines that you have in this block should coincide with the number of species you have. Uh, and well, as you can see just from the start, you, these are the, basically the two types of, of inputs that you will find in, in, in a CSI input file. You can find either um, single options, single variables, or blocks. Uh, if you go further below in that FDF, you will find information on the geometry of the system. Uh, in this case, we have first the lattice constant, which in this case we set it as 15 angstrom. Note that we have units. Uh, in the Siesta FDF uh, inputs, usually you can set units for physical magnitudes. Uh, in the case of the lattice constant, you could also place it as bore, if you would want to, nanometers. Uh, so long as it is supported by the FDF format, should be okay. Then we find a second block for the lattice vectors of the systems, since Siesta, as uh, you mentioned, works in periodic 
conditions, then we have uh, the lattice vectors. Uh, this is one way of setting the lattice vectors for the system in which we have the XYZ coordinates for each of the vectors. Uh, since we are doing 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, what this means is that we have a square box, a, a cube box, um, which if we multiply it by the lattice constant, which is 15 angstrom, this means that we will have our methane molecule in a 15 times 15 times 15 box. Uh, below there, you will find the atomic coordinate format, which basically indicates in which format are we inputting the, the, the coordinate for atom. This could be angstrom, Bohr, uh, fractional, which would mean that they are fractional with respect to the lattice vectors. And then, well, there are other options that we will not cover here, for example, the Zeta matrix options. And then, in the atomic coordinates and species block, you will find a set of coordinates for each of the atoms, and then the atomic species index. So, uh, if we go back, we see that the first, um, the first species is carbon, species number one is carbon, species number two is hydrogen. So, once we get here, we see that they have, we have species one in the zero, 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 and species two in the rest of the coordinates. This means that we have the carbon in the zero, 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 and the hydrogens in the rest of, of the places. Um, then we have more options. We will cover this later in the, in the other tutorials. Uh, but you have options regarding the basis sets, the mesh cutoff, which uh, I mean, you mentioned already for the grid. Uh, options for the accelerating the, the SCF cycle uh, and the solver options that we will cover tomorrow. Um, with that said, uh, let's have a look at what you will, what, the, what you will find in the outputs. Uh, I will cover this briefly and then you can run this yourself and test that everything is working okay. Uh, once you run Siesta, you will find a lot of files in, in your in, in your working directory. Uh, these have a lot of information that, uh, depending on what you are doing, you will care only about some of these, maybe probably a few. Uh, examples of these outputs are, for example, the one that contains the forces and stresses for the system, the one that contains only the forces of, on atoms, uh, a file containing the constant eigenvalues, uh, timing information, the density matrix restart, if you need to restart from a previous point, uh, the coordinate and velocities restart. Uh, XV stands for uh, coordinates and velocities. So this is relevant when you do um, uh, molecular dynamics runs, for example. Uh, and then what's probably more, more important to you these days is the general output file, which is the dot out, or however you choose to name it. And uh, you will find this name in the in the submission script that you have. You can change it. You can call it for potato for all I care. Uh, so long as you know what you are calling it and you know where to find it, it's OK. If not, if you do not set a, a general output file, Siesta will output everything to standard output. So do that at, at your own risk. Um, so in the general output, what What's in there? Well, in the general output, there is a lot of information. Uh, you, you will start by some information on the compilation that you are running, uh, then some information on the parallelization if you're running in parallel, uh, and uh, of course, the, the start time for, for the run. Further below, you will find a dump of the FDF file of your input. If you check this and you go to, to your FDF, this should be more or less, more or less not, it should be the same option. Um, further below, you'll find information on the species and the pseudo potentials that Siesta is loading for this species. Uh, you will find information on the basis set, then uh, a general dump of uh, the initial coordinates of the system and some options that you are running in case you want to come back later and see, oh, what the hell was I doing with this simulation? Okay, let's see what options are here. This is also useful to check whether you are running the thing that you intended to run. Um, and then we have basically the start of the calculation itself. 
Uh, we have the type of run that we are running. In its case, a single point, but it could be molecular dynamics, for example, or TDDRT. Uh, you have information on the sparsity of the system. This was not, I think, Emilio only touched on it, uh, but matrices in siesta are sparse because it's a way to basically save on memory and do calculations more efi efficiently. Uh, then we have information on the mesh that we mentioned already. Uh, more on this will be covered later. And we find the, we find the initial energy breakdown, the, the nonsense self-consistent energy. Once we have all that, which is basically the beginning of the calculation, we jump into the SCF cycle information. We get our converged energy, total forces, and self stress uh, in, a, in a very short form. If we had, if we were doing a molecular dynamic simulation, for example, this will be this would start repeating over and over and over for each of the molecular dynamics step. And then once our calculation is finally done, we find the final energy breakdown. Uh, we find the final forces, the final stress, the electric dipole, and any kind of properties that we are calculating, information of the bands, if we ask, it, if we ask for bands, information of uh, molecular charges, boronoid charges, whatever properties we are asking for it. And uh, in the bottom of your output file, you will find information on bibliography and the, uh, the, end of, uh, the time for the end of run. Uh, Usually, if you want to check if your calculation went well, you just do a tail of this file and you see job completed and you're happy with it. Um, so now I will encourage you to try this. Uh, let me go back and remind you where things are. Uh, so basically, you could you can copy this. Uh, this folder into your home or whenever, wherever you, you, you're running the stuff and just uh, test uh, your, your own with Siesta and see what, what you find. Uh, I think I will give you 10 minutes for this, should be more than enough. Um, so if there are no questions for now, or maybe we could leave those for later, uh, let me go ahead into the second part of this tutorial. Uh, uh, it's worth noting that, well, for this tutorial in particular, most of I will be most of what I'm saying here is what's on the text of the page. Uh, but for other tutorials, it would be very useful if you later come back to the tutorial and read thoroughly because these tutorials have uh, quite a lot of information. Uh, so it would be very useful if, if you need to know something, it's probably written there already. Um, so having had our first encounter with Siesta, let's have a look into what you would say the level of theory of, 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 of what you want to run. Uh, by level of theory, I mean uh, basically three things which is the pseudo potential, the um, exchange correlation function that you will be using and the basis set. Um, usually when you run Siesta, you want to check these five things among, among others. Some and you will need to do extra checks depending on the kind of simulation and system that you want to run. But you should generally care about choosing an appropriate uh, DFT functional. Uh, choosing the appropriate pseudo potentials, the appropriate basis set, converge the mesh cutoff and the k point sampling, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in the next ten, five to 10 minutes, I will talk about this uh, and well, the first and the third, really. Uh, the test of pseudo potentials is uh, very specific to the kind of system and simulation that you want to run. So the answer there is to go read the literature on what you are trying to run and see how they are testing the, the pseudo potentials for that kind of system specifically. Uh, the other two parts will be covered later today by Catalina. Uh, so by the end of this day, you should have a clear picture on, on this entire uh, sanity checks, let's say. Uh, um, this tutorial will be in the same place, but in the second folder in 0.2 first counter 2. 
and you will also find the link in the in page uh, for the second part of the tutorial. Uh, this is split into different tutorial into different pages for the sake of sanity, because if not, it will be extremely long. Uh, so regarding the exchange correlation function, it's a bit the same as with pseudo potentials. You should know what you're trying to do and what is recommended for that kind of run. Uh, so read the literature and see if your the, the the exchange correlation functional that you want to use is able to reproduce the property that you are trying to calculate. Uh, Specifying siesta which DFT functional to use is relatively easy. You first choose the, the type of functional, LDA, GGA, or Van der Waals, and then you choose the functional authors. Of course, these two must be consistent. You cannot say LDA, PPE. Uh, siesta will not like that. And a general recommendation is that you should also choose the appropriate pseudo potentials. You will find this in the tutorial that Siesta will tell you, hey, you are trying to run a GGA, but you're using a pseudo potential generated for LDA. Um, usually between functionals of the same family, for example, between GGAs, this is not generally an issue. Uh, but using uh, an LDA for either Van der Waals or GGA is generally a not a good idea. Uh, so you should choose the functional first and then go pick the pseudo potential that you want. Uh, so with that said, let's jump into this the second part of the, the, the level of theory, let's say, which is some basic options of basic sets. I will not get too deep into this since the next talk from Miguel will cover more or less in detail, but for now it's suffice to say that uh, in Siesta we have the atom certain basis set that will uh, basically become zero after a certain point, which is the cutoff radii for the first zeta orbitals and the matching radii for the second zeta orbitals. Uh, as Emilio already explained, when I mean single zeta, multiple zeta, that means that means the amount of functions that we have for uh, the valence orbitals of the atom. So, for example, uh, in in carbon, uh, which has the two s and the two p orbitals, for a single zeta, that's uh, four functions. But for a double zeta, that's eight functions, two for each of the orbitals involved. Uh, in case you add polarization orbitals, so you have a double zeta basis and you add a polarization orbitals, it becomes a d zeta p. And the P means that you are an extra set of orbitals that are polarizing the last shell uh, that you included. So, for example, in the case of carbon again, since the last shell is a, uh, is a P orbital, then you will find uh, that the polarization orbitals are the uh, D orbitals. So, in the case of carbon again, uh, you for a DCP, you have uh, 2S and, and 3 you have the 1, 2s orbital and the 3, 2s, 2p orbitals, so that's four. Since it's a double zeta, that's eight. And since you are adding uh, polarization orbitals that are d, you have five more. So this means that for a carbon atom in a DCP basis, you find 13 uh, functions. Uh, so these next options that I will show you are the bare minimum that you can touch in Siesta to, to get some kind of basis set. And these are for you to toy around before jumping into the real optimization of the basis. So these are these are useful if you want to jump, just run a quick test and see how this behaves. Uh, so first is the payo basis size, which determines what I was talking about, the cardinality, the amount of functions that you have per atom, uh, which can be SC, SCP, DCP, etc. Then we have the energy shift. The energy shift is a way to control the uh, cutoff radii for the orbitals in a more or less cohesive way. Miguel will talk about this later. I will not get into this right now. I will only say that a lower energy shift results in a larger or uh, why well, yes, larger orbitals with larger cutoff radius. Um, there is also the split norm, which basically controls how the matching radio of the second and third zeta orbitals relate to the first zeta orbital. Uh, and there is the option with soft confinement. I will skip this. 
this is not relevant for now. Uh, so uh, having said that, well, before before running, I will briefly touch on on something that I was expecting to say later, but I'd rather give you the time to to play around with this. So I mentioned basically two two options that are relevant for you at this point, which are the cardinality and the energy shift. The cardinality controls the amount of functions per atom, and the energy shift controls how long those atoms are. These have different impacts in, the, in, in your calculation in terms of computational cost. Uh, both increase quality, but the cost increases differently because cardinality, having more functions, uh, has a higher impact in terms of uh, the diagonalization of the system, which is square, which uh, scales to n cube. Meanwhile, the energy shift usually increases the cost of uh, grid-related operations, so that scales linearly. This means that for small systems, when, when you're running a few dozens of atoms, you will find that grid operations are the most dominant part or take up about 50% of the time of your calculations. However, when you go into larger uh, and larger systems, you will find that uh, the diagonalization term becomes dominant because it scales to n cube. This is mainly the reason why we use accelerators only when going to uh, large numbers of atoms, because for fewer atoms, this is not very useful. But for larger atoms, uh, accelerating the, the diagonalization becomes very, very important. Um, this also means that uh, if you have a large number of atoms, around a thousand probably, uh, you will find that increasing, uh, decreasing the energy shift will not have a higher uh, cost in, in the calculation. So having said that, I will leave you to, uh, to the tutorial itself. Uh, find this. This is here, and I let you play around with it. Um, I think this is for, for this session, so feel free to play around with this, ask questions. Uh, Young Leg, I think we have a coffee break later. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Miguel Pruneda from the, the Spanish National Research Center, CECIC. Um, and I'm going to talk about the, the well, get a, a, a little bit deeper into some of the things that have already been introduced by, by Emilio and Federico, which are related to the basic sets that uh, we use in system. Okay, but first, uh, uh, a recap of some of the things that, that Emilio said. Uh, okay, we are we are in uh, we are DFT. We use Consham. You know that the central uh, uh, player in uh, the central player is the electronic density, and we need to describe the electronic uh, the the, the Consham electronic state by some kind of uh, uh, of functions. Okay. In general, what we 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 do is is an expansion of the electronic wave functions in terms of, of some support basis functions. And uh, and uh, and we have m of these uh, basis functions, and we have to do this expansion. Uh, at the end, determining what are the electronic wave functions means determining what are the coefficients of these of these basis functions. Uh, if we take this expression and substitute here, uh, or in the in the Consham equation, we end up having a a, a generalized uh, eigenvalue plot problem where we have some matrix elements of the Hamiltonian. We have the coefficients. We have the overlap between the uh, with, between the, the the functions, the basis functions, uh, and we have to uh, solve this uh, eigenvalue problem. Okay. Uh, if we take the expansion and we substitute on the on the expression of the electronic density, we end up uh, having an expression in which we have again the density matrix, as Emilio mentioned uh, earlier this morning, and some uh, uh, orbital functions here. Now, what are these uh, these orbital functions? Uh, in case of a, a periodic system, uh, instead of having some uh, uh, well, we have to satisfy the, the block theorem, and instead of having just some uh, functions that are uh, 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 centered on position of space, we have basically the replicas of these functions periodically repeated in the in the function. But we have to 
we have to define some kind of block orbitals, which are just uh, periodic repetitions with some phases uh, uh, of our uh, support functions. Okay, if we do this, then the the block states uh, depend on a, on a lattice vector k, and uh, the uh, uh, eigenvalue problems becomes a generalized eigenvalue problems where we have a k dependence of the Hamiltonian, and we have coefficients that depend on k. Uh, and basically, uh, we have to do this for each point in the reciprocal space. So diagonalizing this, sol solving this this problem to obtain the the energy uh, that is k dependence for each of the bands uh, and each of the k points. Uh, so what are these uh, uh, these basis functions? In general, we can define uh, any kind of uh, um, of uh, 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 functional form to describe the Hilbert space. In, for, for, for physicists, we usually uh, uh, re rely on plane waves, which is like, like the, the best fit when you have periodic boundary conditions. Um, they have certain advantages, but they also, they also have some drawbacks. For chemists, it's more common to, to talk about uh, atomic orbitals, and, and, and we have the linear combination of, of atomic orbitals, as uh, Emilio mentioned. But there are any other numerical forms, the numerical functions that we can have, we can define uh, wavelets on, or, or uh, Bessel functions or augmented plane waves or muffin teams or whatever other combinations. So what are some of the problems of the plane waves? Uh, the first thing is that they are, well, they are well adapted to periodic boundary conditions, but they are, that also means that if you have uh, a very large supercell and you have vacuum, uh, you also have the plane waves in the vacuum, so the vacuum will cost you also energy. If you have uh, some orbitals, atomic orbitals that are uh, very picky, very very localized, like d orbitals or f orbitals in, uh, in in heavier elements, then you need more plane waves to to be able to describe these kind of, fun of functions. Uh, and this is related to also to the to the uh, uh, another problem that has to do with how you describe local fields uh, with plane waves that expand everywhere. So the 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 techniques that are that that were originally uh, uh, developed to 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 allow for for this uh, uh, near sightedness uh, of the, the electronic wave functions uh, that that open the door to the linear scaling methods are not that directly uh, applicable when you have plane waves. Uh, whereas with atomic orbitals, that's uh, the natural uh, uh, choice if you want to if you want to. Do. Okay, uh, the atomic orbitals, they can, as, as Emilia uh, mentioned, they could, they could have in, in principle any, any form, but what, uh, what we typically have with, uh, with, uh, with a linear combination of atomic orbitals are uh, functions that can be split into a uh, radial, radial shape and a harmonic state. Okay, so you have different indexes to define the, to, to determine what are the, the, or to label the atomic uh, uh, orbitals. First, you have an atomic index. So in this particular atom, I have these uh, orbitals. Then you have the angular momentum and the magnetic quantum numbers, uh, which basically determine what are the shape of the, of the uh, angular uh, part. Uh, and then we have some indexes to determine the number of uh, orbitals uh, with different radial shapes, if, if you want. Okay, you have the uh, 1s uh, or the 2s, or you have the 3f orbital, uh, the, the 3d orbitals, and so on. Um, now, um, this uh, uh, angular part is, is general, is generic, is the, the, the kind of shapes that you are familiar with uh, uh, from, from, from your chemistry textbook. And the radial shape can have any kind of form. They could be just a slater uh, orbitals, or you can have uh, Gaussian orbitals, which are very, very common in, in, in quantum chemistry, or you can have uh, any numerical real space grid uh, as, uh, with the shape of the skyline of, uh, of New York, as a media show, where you can do anything. Um, uh, in general, what, 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 uh, what, what is a, a meaningful approximation is to have a radial shape, which is the solution of the of the of the atom of the pseudo atomic uh, uh, potential. Okay, so what are some of the uh, uh, good things and bad things about the the basis? The first, the first, uh, first, the, the, the good things is that they are very efficient in terms of uh, how many orbitals you have per atom. They are very well suited to describe 
localize things, and, and, and then it's, uh, they are very useful for, for the linear scaling uh, methods. Uh, these two combined means that you have a large reduction on the computational time and on the memory cost. Another good thing is that you don't have to put, in principle, uh, basis functions where you don't expect to have electrons. So they are, uh, uh, that, that means that you can describe vacuum at not cost, in, in principle, and you don't need to, to have periodicity in your system. Uh, uh, and then another good point is that when you are analyzing things, uh, as, as we will see tomorrow, uh, it's very good to have a, a, a direct access to what kind of charge you are going to have in your uh, P set orbitals in, in graphene, for example. Okay, so the, all the chemical information uh, is directly accessible. You can you can have the composition of charges, and you can do projections of the density of states, and so on. Now the problems have to do on how you define these bases. In principle, as opposed to plane wave, where you just have to increase the the energy of the of your plane wave to to have a better resolution uh, of, of your systems. So you have just to tune some parameter, and you know how to do that. With the plane waves, uh, oh sorry, with the with the local bases, you don't have this kind of uh, this kind of uh, of uh, easy uh, uh, hub that you can just tune and you automatically get a basis that is better. So you need a lot of human uh, inter intervention to define what is the best basis that you are going to have for your problem for your system. And this is uh, this is the topic of the of the next uh, uh, tutorial that Federico will will present. They are also spatially biased, uh, which means that uh, uh, if you don't have a base uh, a basis set in a particular region of space, you are not going to be able to describe the electronic states that are there. And this also has some implications on the on the basis set superposition error that uh, that Emilio mentioned earlier this morning. Uh, another problem is that your if you have uh, basis orbitals that are localized on your atoms, when you move the atom, the basis is going to be moving with the atoms, and that introduces some extra corrections, some extra terms that have to be taken into account. And in, in, in terms of the forces, these are known as the, as the Poulet corrections to the forces. Uh, another uh, limitation is that computing some matrix elements could be, could be complex uh, um, and computationally expensive. They have it's a, it's a it's a it's a duality here because they are you have less orbitals they are localized in space but but in principle means that your calculation is going to be cheaper but you also have to do some tricks on computing some of the matrix elements. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit mo uh, more into uh, what are the 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 what 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 is the flexibility that you have when defining the, the atomic orbitals. As I said, you can split this into two contributions because your your orbital, uh, I lost my mouse. Your orbital has, yeah, yeah, oops. Uh, your orbital uh, is decomposing a radial uh, or, uh, function and an uh, angular uh, function. So you can increase the, the, the quality of your basis by playing with a radial flexibility. So in pre, in increasing the degrees of freedom that you have in uh, in this contribution in in the radial uh, uh, part and you can also increase the flexibility that you have in the in the angular part uh, in the first case we we typically um, uh, have different uh, uh, tiers for the basis uh, you can go from the minimal basis set in which you just have one radial function to describe a, a particular atomic shell uh, that's a single Zeta or simple Zeta uh, uh, basis description, but you can al also add other radial functions to describe the same shell, okay? the same angular momentum, and that's the multiple Zeta. So you can have the multiple Zeta, the double Zeta, which means you have two radial functions to describe the, for example, the 2s orbitals or the, or, or the uh, uh, 4d orbital, uh, and, and then you can start increasing more and more radial functions, and you go to triple Zeta, quadruple Zeta, and so on. Uh, you also you can also have some uh, uh, longer or more extended uh, orbitals, the diffuse uh, functions that uh, that can have a, a, a different form. They have a longer tail and they extend more into 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 the, the surrounding of the atom. 
Um, and you can also include the vessel function there if you, if you want. Then you have the angular flexibility, and here is where the polarization orbitals that that, uh, that were introduced before uh, come. So you can you can add uh, 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 you can add angular flexibility, but by allowing your basis to have higher momentum uh, uh, harmonic spherics in your in your in your system. For example, if you have carbon, you can include the d orbitals. If you have a transition metal with d electrons, you can include the f electrons and so on. Okay, so what is the general uh, uh, procedure of uh, working with these uh, standard standardized tiers? Uh, uh, as Federico said, um, if you have a, a very large system uh, in, uh, in general, um, you are going to have many orbitals, your Hamiltonian, the matrix that you have to diagonalize depends on how many you have large systems with many orbitals that's going to be computationally expensive. So in general, if you have something that is very, very large and you want to have a, a quick calculation, you usually decrease the, the number of, uh, of CETAs in your in your basis. You go to the minimal basis uh, and that allows to, uh, uh, to do a, a quick calculation with a minimal basis set. Uh, that's, that's just uh, uh, that's advisable only if you want to to do some exploration. In general, what you have to do is to tune the, the, the quality of the basis. The better the basis, the, the better the, the, the larger the number of orbitals that you have in your basis, uh, the, the better your results are going to do. So you have to, to, to get a, a compromise between getting something that is cheap with minimal basis and something that is accurate with a, a, a number of orbitals that, that, that is uh, computational uh, 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 possible, but also give some high quality uh, and well converged calculations. So you have to you have to bias, you have to, to do some preliminary tests always to see in which uh, uh, range of this uh, arrow you, you are going to you are going to work. And in general, it's it's good to, to start with something simple, simple to see, okay, how how expensive how, yeah, how, how much computing time I'm going to need, uh, and then try to increase the basis to get something that is meaningful at the end. Okay. But all this is part of the human intervention that you have to you have to take into account when you are doing the the, the calculations with uh, with uh, with uh, atomic orbitals. Okay, just uh, just to give a, 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 a repeat, uh, repeat some of the of the things that have been, been already mentioned. This this is just to give an idea of how many orbitals you have when you have the different tiers uh, in your basis. And, and and this is the the example of silicon and iron. Okay, so you have the balance configuration of silicon. Is the 3s2, uh, 3p2 uh, orbitals. If you have the minimal basis, that means you just have one radial shape for each of the uh, of the of the of the shells. That means that you have in total four electrons. Uh, sorry, four uh, orbitals. If you have the double zeta, then you go to eight. And uh, if you have uh, if you add the polarizations, uh, that means that you add the five d electrons, uh, and in total you have thirteen. In iron. Uh, the valence configuration has S electrons and has D electrons. So in total, for a simple zeta, you will have the S and the five D electrons. So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, six uh, six orbitals. If you go to double zeta, you double that. You have twelve. And if you include the polarization in general, here the polarization will go to the S electrons. Uh, so that means adding the P orbitals. But you could also add. I add the f orbitals to polarize the d electrons if you think that's uh, that's important. So these are the kind of things that, in general, you have to start thinking about when you are playing with uh, uh, defining what is the, the size of the basis that you have to you have to use. Okay, what's the relevance of all this? Um, as I said, in principle, uh, uh, as you increase the quality, the number of orbitals in your basis, you 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 get better results. And this is just a a, a typical comparison on uh, the energy of silicon when you start playing with the different bases. Okay, you go from the minimal basis in which you have just four orbitals, uh, double zeta, you double the bases and you go to triple zeta, then you add the polarizations and, uh, and, and then you, add, you can add different levels of polarizations. And you see that the energy is decreasing as you increase the number of orbitals, which is uh, good. Uh, and this is a co comparison with the energy that you will get with a plane wave calculation. So, uh, and the numbers here below are just uh, how many plane waves you are included, including in your calculation. Um, and you see that the, the, the accuracy between, uh, or, or the comparison, the difference in energy between a, a, a calculation 
uh, in which you have uh, just 34 orbitals, uh, uh, atomic orbitals, uh, is comparable to a plane wave calculation in which you have 200 orbitals, okay, the 200 uh, plane waves. And if you increase the quality, if you if you further increase the number of orbitals in your in your basis set, you can get better uh, accuracy. Okay, and this is just a table showing uh, how uh, the lattice constant and the bulk mandrels and and, and 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 the cohesive energy uh, of uh, of a siesta calculation with different bases compares with plane waves and and, and experiments. Now, um, I will mention this later, but it's important uh, when you do these things uh, to compare uh, apples with apples and not apples with, with peers. Uh, when you are playing with the optimization of the basis set, you can decide to uh, fit your basis set so that your, um, uh, your, your model, your theory, your level of theory agrees with the experiments. Uh, and then you, can, you, are, you are playing with the parameters to, to adjust uh, a particular um, quantity, and this is very per very uh, uh, dangerous, dangerous because um, that's uh, that's not the way you should compare. You should compare if you are just playing with the with the with the quality of your basis. You should compare with the best possible basis that you have uh, using all the same level of theory. So in principle, this kind of plots are the, that I'm showing here. That's comparing apple with apple. So you have you are just playing with the number of uh, or, or with the type of basis that you have. All the other parameters like the exchange correlation, the 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 the, the pseudo potentials, uh, the convergence parameters uh, for the cage read and uh, temperature and so on. All that should be the same. Otherwise, you are you are mm, making something that is that is wrong in principle. So that's a, a general principle. If you want to optimize a basis, you have to, to do it with respect to the same level of theory with the best quality basis that you can achieve. Uh, OK, now uh, going uh, back a, a little bit to the, to the uh, different contributions that we have, what is the functional uh, uh, shape that you, that you can, so how, how do you define the radial, the radial uh, function? Uh, and what kind of functions you can define to to to, to get the different theta uh, orbitals? So uh, yeah. as uh, as we have uh, said before, there is there are um, in Siesta you have uh, uh, strictly localized atomic orbitals. You have some orbitals that goes to zero beyond certain cutoff orbit. Okay, but in principle, the the form of uh, of this radial is is quite flexible, and you can adjust this in, in different ways. There are uh, 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 there are a number of uh, uh, of uh, uh, standard or default values in Siesta that are uh, reasonable, uh, but you can also play with uh, with uh, with them and adjust them to get whatever you want. Okay. Um, in general, uh, they are solution of the pseudo atom, and you have some modifications, as I said, and uh, one of them. Uh, one of the most important is probably the cutoff radian of your orbital. Um, so, how do you define this cutoff or uh, cutoff uh, radia? That's uh, basically determined by uh, uh, something that is called the energy shift, and that's the, uh, essentially the energy that that uh, that costs to localize the orbital within certain uh, radius. And the idea behind this. Uh, uh, is that uh, if you solve, uh, uh, if you have a certain uh, potential well, uh, that is uh, the, the, the the potential well of your of your atom, um, you only you 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 can have only certain allowed values, uh, uh, energy energy uh, quantized energy values, okay, and the shape of the orbital in principle should uh, should have tails that go to to zero uh, at infinity. If you try uh, an eigenvalue value that is slightly above this, that means that the, 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 the shape of the orbital has to go to minus infinity uh, uh, when, when you go far away. And that means that you have some, some value in which the orbital goes exactly to zero. And this is the trick that, that we use to define uh, uh, the, 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 the cutoff radius of the orbital. So we define some energy shift, so how much away from the real eigenvalue uh, eigen energy of the of the constant equation um, to 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 define what is the 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 cutoff radius of your orbital. 
So the larger this energy shift, um, the the fastest it has to go to minus infinity. So the shorter is the the cutoff radius. So basically, just by by playing with this uh, with this parameter, we can. Um, By, by playing just with this parameter, we can define the cutoff area of, of your orbital. And uh, in principle, if you have uh, 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 orbitals that are very long, very extended into into uh, into the tail that we should have, then you have better results. And this is uh, just an illustration of uh, how the lattice parameter and the different parameters, the, the, the cohesive energy of, of silicon converges as we increase the cutoff radius of your orbital. Um, you see that in general they converge. If you have a, a good basis, they converge to the plane wave calculation. Okay. Uh, as Federico was mentioning, a larger radio means that you have more accurate calculations, but also you are increasing the range of the orbitals. That means that the orbital is has uh, interactions with other neighbors that are farther away. So that slightly increases the computational cost uh, because you have to to compute more uh, more overlaps uh, contributions but but that that cost is not that that much and it scales with the with the system size uh, okay and um, the other thing uh, is that you can truncate the the shape of the of the orbitals with a with a potential well that goes to infinity at your cutoff uh, radia or you can have some softer uh, form of the of the of the hardware uh, potential, uh, which now I think is the, the default in Siesta. Uh, so that means that, that that means that the shape of the the radial shape of your orbitals is smoother as it goes to the to, to zero, uh, as opposed to a sharp uh, um, kink in the in the in the derivative. And these orbitals are better in, in principle than the than the Sankey potentials. Okay, how do you define the different uh, uh, zetas? Once you have the first zeta determined, you can consider uh, uh, orbitals with different nodes. So the highest, uh, 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 um, the, the different uh, zetas can be defined with uh, uh, with nodes, and that's uh, that has some good points and so uh, drawbacks. Uh, the uh, standard way of defining the the basis in siesta is with the split balance method. Which basically uh, uh, uses some uh, reference value for the for the for the second zeta or for the the, the subsequent zetas that is just uh, determined uh, 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 by by some value which is the the difference the norm that is uh, the, the, that is in the tail of the orbital. Uh, so there are basically uh, uh, there is basically one extra parameter that is the split norm. Which by default is zero point fifteen, and that's uh, that's reasonable, and that allows to define the different the different uh, zetas. Uh, for the polarization orbitals, it was mentioned before that you can define uh, it in two ways. One is a perturbative polarization, which you you consider your atomic orbitals and you apply uh, uh, an electric field, and that basically modifies the shape, uh, increases the angular momentum, and modifies the shape of the orbital. Or you can uh, have atomic polarizations in which you are directly including orbitals with higher angular moment, <clears throat> and, and both uh, approaches are uh, are possible. You just have to define them in the in the in the in the input in a different way. Uh, okay, this is just a, a recap. There is a, the general procedure is to start with a, with a, a, a simple uh, basis and then start increasing the flexibility and doing some tests in between. Um, <clears throat> now, um, you have multiple options to generate the basis. Uh, you can rely on this hierarchical structure. Uh, the default bases are, in general, in general uh, reasonable, but the optimal basis, the optimal shape of the orbitals, is, will depend on the environment. And that's why it's important before uh, doing any of your calculations to start uh, to do some tests and see how good your basis is. Uh, in, the, in the next um, tutorial, you will be playing with this, uh, uh, with this kind of things. But the general philosophy is that uh, if you are going to spend uh, several months working on a particular project, it's better to spend 
a couple of days optimizing the basis and get and, and being sure that your basis is good enough uh, for the kind of problems that you that you have to to do. So one general principle is that you take a, a, a simple system that describes your uh, uh, objective, your final object, your, your final problem, and you optimize the basis. For this simple system, because you will have to be running uh, different calculations, uh, 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 cheap calculations with different bases, and try to get the bases that that gets the the the, the, the lowest energy and the, and the more accurate results. Um, now, some uh, information about the inputs that you are going to have in the in your in your bases. The 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 the, the default thing will be. Uh, a double theta polarized uh, uh, basis, but this can be modified with uh, with the PAO, PAO basis size. Uh, the other uh, important parameters, as I mentioned, are the energy shift, which determines what is the range of the orbitals, and the uh, and the split norm, which determines what are, what is the difference between the first theta and the second theta, and so on. And these are basically the the the, the, the main parameters that you have to do. Now, if you want to have more flexibility on the kind of basis that you have, you can uh, use blocks in the input and determine uh, different levels of uh, basis for each of the elements or each of the species that you want to, to have in your problem. So you can you can combine a simple theta polarized with a double theta and a triple theta double polarized and so on. So you can you have different levels there. If you want to increase even better uh, what is the um, the basis and, and to determine better what is the basis that you want to have, then you can use the block PAO basis uh, uh, option. And, and this has a, a structure that I think it's worth uh, explaining a little bit before you go into, into, the, into the tutorial. So for each of the species in which you want to define a specific basis, uh, if you don't do that, it says that will take the default value, but whoops, what happened? I lost my presentation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, for each of the orbitals that you have, <clears throat> you have the chemical species and you have to define how many shells you have. In this uh, example, you have oxygen, then you define the first shell, which is the N equal to L equal zero. So this is the 2S orbital. And you have a two here, which means that you have a double theta uh, basis for the 2S. Then you have the 2p, this is the uh, L equal 1, so this is, these are the 2p orbitals, and again you have a 2, which means that you have double theta. But then you also include a polarization here, a p option here with 1. This means that you have one polarization, one shell of polarization orbitals that are simple theta. Then you have these two columns, uh, which determine their cutoff radia for the first theta and the second theta and the norm of the first seat and the second seat. These numbers, in general, you, you just have to keep one. And in the, in the, for the radii, if you leave it zero, that means that you just uh, uh, let siesta determine the cutoff radius by itself. But you can put here a specific number, uh, and then siesta will generate a pseudo atom with that cutoff radius. Another way of defining the polarization orbitals, instead of putting here the p, is just to define it explicitly, like in this case. I'm polarizing the two p orbitals with a 3d orbital okay and this is another way of defining the polarization and i think i ran out of time and i better stop here uh, maybe there are questions thank you if we we can see more questions yeah there were two questions uh which is <clears throat> one which was uh, what about full full atom? I guess the question was full electron calculations without pseudos. Another electron calculation. Um, so I, I think the answer here is siesta as a theoretical method. Yes, you could in principle do it. Siesta as a program expects you to have a pseudo potential. Yeah. Uh, there are exceptions for semi-core states and that kind of stuff, but you should always have a pseudo potential for core electrons. Yeah. yeah. So you could the, the, what what Federico is saying is that you could include in your pseudo potential some core electrons as part of the balance, that the, the semi-core approximation as in, in other codes. That 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 is doable. Uh, but having an all electron that yeah, you, you need a pseudo potential for that. 
Uh, and the other one was uh, in the base set convergence that you showed, which was for silicon. Uh, does this graph show the same general trend for any system, or is it very system dependent? Uh, the uh, what this this kind of things, I guess. The yes. This one. Uh, this one. Ah, yeah, that one. Uh, well, this in uh, yeah. So here, the trend in in general should be like this. Now, uh, if in silicon, it's very critical that you include the polarization, for example. And in many systems, it's very critical that you include the polarization. Actually, in, in this example, uh, improving from simple zeta to double zeta, uh, to, sorry, to triple zeta, uh, I mean, you have an improvement, but it's not as critical as including the p orbitals. Uh, if you have a simple zeta, with polarization, you decrease the energy by, by quite a lot. So that means that you really need to have the polarizations. In other systems, mm, you have to try. Uh, in general, uh, including the polarization is a, is a good option, always. But how many polarizations orbitals uh, on, on, on what shells, that's not so, so, so sensitive. But the general principle is that if you have uh, more orbitals, Okay, so I guess we can jump right into the optimization tutorial. Let me share. So, hey, it's me again. Uh, so let's talk a few things about basis of the optimization, which is now, now this is one of the important parts in Siesta because uh, as we have been saying Siesta is very concerned with efficiency, but the efficiency comes at the cost of choosing the right basis for your system. Um, so I will not repeat this yet again. Uh, what is important here is that when you generate a basis set, you can use it. And you could save, for example, the basis set files and use them on another system, or you can just copy your uh, basic set block, uh, I will show it later, uh, onto other files, and you can keep using the same basis set. Uh, so let's get. Um, for this purpose, we will have to take into account the thing that Miguel just showed about the pale basis block. Uh, so he explained it already, but let me uh, refresh it a bit. Um, so in the pale basis block, you will find uh, all of the species that you have in your stem. Uh, for example, in, in this tutorial, we'll be covering a water molecule. So we'll have hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, in the, so for hydrogen, we first find that uh, we have a single orbital, a single valence orbital, which is the n equals 1, l equals 0, so it's the 1s orbital. The following number means that we have a double zeta basis, and the p1 specifies that we are adding a polarization orbital. So for hydrogen here, we have uh, two 1s orbitals, so it's 1s functions, so it's like two functions, plus the three polarization orbitals, we have five functions per hydrogen. Then for oxygen, we find that we have a, a two valence orbitals, the 2s here and the 2p here, here equals zero, l equals one. Then again, double theta and the orbital all the, over the p orbital. This entire block here is the same as if we had a specified PO basis size DCP. This is exactly the same. What are these zeros here? These zeros here are the cutoff radii and the matching radii for the orbitals, which mean this here, this place here where we are setting our functions to zero beyond that point. Um, if we set them, uh, if we put zero as a value for the cutoff and the matching radii, Siesta will try to find it automatically from the energy shift. So again, this whole block is the same as if we had just said uh, payo basis size DCP. 
why then write this entire block? Because the very minimal optimization that we can do with our basis set is choosing this uh, matching radii and cutoff radii manually. Uh, this is relatively simple and it will allow us, allow us to have a very good quality basis set in general. There are of course other options. This whole block has a ton of options that you can toy around with, but just choosing manually the cutoff and matching radii is the best you can do for uh, good quality results. Um, so having said that, how do we choose them? So we can start modifying those blindly and see what happens. But as we were saying before, just increasing the, for example, increasing the, the radius of the orbital will keep going to lower energies, for example. So when do we stop? We need a way to say, okay, these orbitals are large enough. Let's stop here. Uh, so that we don't keep mindlessly, mindlessly increasing the, the, the size of our orbitals. And that, that thing that will allow us to tell, to tell like these orbitals are large enough, is a concept that is not a physical concept per se, which is the basis enthalpy. The basis enthalpy is just the total energy of a given system plus a term that depends on the uh, volume of the orbitals. Uh, this has this looks like uh, some sort of work, right? Uh, pressure times volume. So what is this pressure? This is a completely fictitious term, the basis pressure, but it's the magnitude that will allow, allow us to add the volume of the orbitals to the total energy. So basically, we will find a minimum for the basis enthalpy at the point that we have the best orbitals. How do we choose the value for the basis pressure? Well, fortunately enough, it's relatively simple. Of course, you can toy around with this. There is, uh, there, there is some literature on, on how to choose this. But as a general rule of thumb, uh, the default for CO2 GPA is more than enough for most cases. That, that should be your go-to value. Uh, there is some, some exceptions made for the first and second row elements because in those cases, this pressure will lead you to very short at, uh, orbitals. So in those cases, we just divide this by 10 and we get properly shaped orbitals. Uh, since we will be using water here, we will be using this value for the basis pressure. So th these two are the guidelines to, to have a, a, a go-to value for, for the basis pressure should be more than enough for everything. But if you want to get into the details of this, then th there is more bibliography of this. So uh, again, you will find the, um, the tutorial files in this folder and the uh, tutorial itself on, on the page. And, and what I will tell you now is start this tutorial. Uh, we will be optimizing uh, the first zeta and cutoff radii and the second zeta matching radii. So for now, just do the first two sections of this tutorial. Um, as a magnitude, we will be using the basis enthalpy, which is more or less the same as the total energy. Uh, and then, then later, we will see how uh, we can check how good our basis set is. Because for now, we are just optimizing. But how do we know if our basis set is good enough? So I will jump into that later for now. OK, <clears throat> so I want to, again, recover a question that was made here, which is uh, Siesta will find out the basis set automatically. Uh, but if we try to optimize ourselves, will the absence be somehow the same or different? It might happen that. Uh, so far, usually your, your results will be better if you spend some time optimizing the race set. And just with this simple optimization of just the cutoff radii will get you much better results. Uh, it could happen that maybe your results are as good in quality and just having increased the energy shift up to some point. But even in that case, <clears throat> you will lower the computational cost. And we, this is something that is not minor the optimized basis sets tend to be much more transferable than the defaults. 
So in which cases you would use the defaults instead of optimizing? Well, you could have, for example, cases in which you want just to test, uh, for example, how the level of theory is affecting something. So you will not spend uh, a day optimizing your base set uh, when you just want to test the effect on, I don't know, using a GGA over an LDA uh, on, and, and its effect on the band gap, for example. Uh, another case would be uh, high throughput calculations in which you can you want to launch a ton of calculations at the same time and you cannot read for very different systems and you cannot really spend time optimizing the basis for each of those systems. The defaults will produce results that are reasonable enough. Are they the best possible results that you can get? Probably if you get uh, an optimized basis set, you will get much better results. But if not, it's not a thing that you should worry too much about. You will get reasonable results. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, it's better to spend some time optimizing. The base set usually will take a few, one day, a few days, depending on what kind of system you have. Um, I will now touch on briefly on something that um, Emilia mentioned, which is the basis of the proposition error. I think Miguel also mentioned something about this. Um, which is important for this case of the water diver. Because you might have seen that uh, even when doing our best basis sets, the results are better, but are still far from what we could get, for example, with plane waves. And that's not an issue of our basis set being bad but because we are forgetting have something that happens with a atom centered basis set. So suppose you have your water dimer here. You have this water dimer and you want to calculate the banding energy. And this water dimer has an electron, an electron density. And then I remove one of the waters. So what happened if part of the description in this water molecule, in the, in the electron density related to this water molecule, was actually coming from the basis functions that the other molecule had. We literally lost those functions. Our description of the electron density now is much poorer. So this means that these two systems are using, using a slightly different uh, descriptions for, for the electron density. On, on, on the space. So how do we compensate for that? Well, there is something called uh, ghost atoms. Ghost atoms means that if we have a dimer like this, instead of just removing this water molecule, we will replace it by something that has the exact same basis functions, but uh, does not have neither electrons nor protons. It's just an, e an empty point in space that has the same basis functions as this molecule would have. Since this has the basis, the same basis functions as other atoms, we call that we call those ghost atoms, even though they are not really atoms. Uh, this is uh, also uh, called the counterpoise uh, correction. This is something that is very well known in uh, atomic center basis. That this is something that happens not only for us, but it will happen for any kind of atom center basis set, for example, uh, Gaussian basis sets, if you're familiar with them. Uh, and this is present in, in, in a lot of cases. So uh, I, uh, there is a next, uh, another tutorial uh, covering this in the documentation webpage. This is going beyond what we want to present here. But if you are interested in this, I would recommend you to go to that tutorial and, uh, and do it. Um, but I will only say that we can use ghost atoms in Siesta, and we will do so by creating new species which have the negative um, the negative atomic number. So in this case, we have a ghost atom, which is an, an regular atom, which is the oxygen. And then we have the ghost oxygen, which we put the negative um, atomic number. And of course, our basis set block, our PIO basis block, will have to reflect this and add extra uh, terms that will depend on the new species that we are creating. Uh, but 
Again, that is something that goes beyond beyond what I'm talking here. I will now leave you with uh, Catalina so that today you will have seen everything that you need to know uh, to run Siesta properly. So all, all, all of these things that we are converging and talking about today are the things that you need to set up your calculation in Siesta. Tomorrow we will start applying all of all of these to uh, like interesting samples and, 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 and different kinds of systems to see what you can do with Siesta. Uh, so Katarina, I leave it all to you. Can you see my screen? Yes. I hope. Yep. Okay, thank you. So uh, hi everyone, I'm Catalina. I'm working together with uh, Federico at ICN2 as a postdoc. And today I will present like the last tutorial that um, will basically be a collection uh, of things that have been said during the whole day. So because we... okay, okay. Uh, today you have seen a little bit about the about the basics of Siesta, how are the inputs, the outputs, and then you uh, heard a lot about basic sets. And finally, we will talk about the other kinds of conversions that we should check before um, concluding that our uh, calculation has enough quality, accuracy, and precision according to what we want to get, which uh, will be the conversions of the sampling of the real space uh, grid, the reciprocal space grid, and also uh, about the self-consistent mixing. So let's start. Uh, all the tutorials that I will uh, present are in the folder, in the folders called uh, O for uh, ABC. So you already have them. So let's start with the sampling. So as uh, Emilio mentioned this uh, in the first talk of this morning, Siesta uses um, 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 uses samples. Um, the main functions in the real space. So um, you plot, you can plot the potentials, densities, and bases on real space, but also there are other, other properties that you obtain after your calculations that uh, should be plotted in the reciprocal space. So we should check that we uh, sample each of these spaces properly. And uh, let's start with the real space. As uh, Emilio mentioned, we, uh, if we have here our 2D structure, uh, we um, mesh, we set a mesh in order to discretize this uh, real space. And how we control how is the how fine is this mesh? We can control it using using the mesh cutoff, which is the which is related with the which which is an energy. Uh, which is an energy, but uh, it's related with the separation between these points, these dots that I uh, put it here. So as higher is the, the mesh cutoff that we are selecting, we will get a finer uh, mesh in the real space. So we will like to optimize uh, the this fineness in order to uh, avoid the aliasing and then to have a proper result. So, so basically, we would like to uh, minimize the difference in energy. So let's see how we can set that in Siesta. So basically, we just need to add uh, this line in our FDF file, mesh cutoff, and saying which is the value that we want to give. If you don't say anything, the default value will be uh, 3,300 Rickbergs. But then, but uh, most of the in most of the cases, you want to set another value. So, for example, you can say whatever one hundred Rickbergs or whatever. So from there, Siesta understands this uh, value and sets the proper uh, mesh. And as has been uh, answered before, uh, we don't set this how many divisions we have in each direction of our system. We set this energy and Siesta decides that according to, in order to fulfill uh, some restrictions that we have because of magic values. And also, and so because of that, it changed a little bit the value of uh, our uh, mesh cutoff. And you also can find this information on, on, your, on the output of your calculation in the main output. You can uh, find the mesh cutoff and you will see the one that you input to Siesta and the one that is really used. 
So how we can decide which is the best value? So we want to minimize uh, the total energy. We also want to have the forces to zero, but that it's not the main issue if we have, for example, a crystalline system. And also we will want to have a reasonable uh, time because, okay, it may be, maybe you can set uh, your uh, mesh cutoff as big as you want in order to have like the best result, but it can took forever. So you have to um, find an agreement between uh, these uh, three concepts. Um, Sorry, I didn't mention that, but uh, it was mentioned before. The the mesh will be set in agreement of the lattice vectors of our system. So, for example, this case corresponds to a system that has A and B equal, and then uh, C it's larger. So here I will show you some results for a, for a really simple structure. In fact, it's the same structure that you used uh, before the methane uh, molecule, and you can see uh, which is the time, the computational time that you will need if you uh, increase the mesh cutoff for a different uh, complexity of uh, basis sets. So as um, as you expect, as uh, more complex is the basis set, you will need more time, and also as higher is the mesh cutoff, the, cap the time also increases. Uh, you can check the time in this times file. There you will find all the decomposition of all the times that Siesta takes in order to uh, compute all the steps of the calculation and also the, um, the total time that takes the calculation. And that is interesting because related, related with what uh, Federico mentioned before, no? some, for as most systems, Siesta will invert more time in some specific parts but then higher systems, the system will invert more time in the diagonalization as you will have a bigger matrix. So sometimes it's interesting to check uh, the times that you are um, using for each part of the process in order to optimize your uh, calculations. Uh, also, we can check the results um, for this for the same molecule uh, regarding the total force of the system. So here I plotted the total forces of the, of the systems as as a of the system as a function of the of the mesh cutoff and you can see if we when we reach around uh 100 between 100 and 150 uh we don't see more um, important changes in the in the forces but however as i said before the most important is to check the energies and we can check the energy from this SESTA output um, below the TAC uh, final energy, where you will have the decomposition on, on, in all the energies of the system. And finally, we will have total. And we, if we plot total, we can see here the energy of our uh, methane molecule uh, as a dependence of the mesh cutoff. As you see, uh, for each, depending on the complexity of our basis set, we will have a different amount, a different value of energy, as uh, Miguel and Federico have already mentioned before. And also, uh, if we uh, look at just the difference in energy, that it's what we are important, that we want to see, um, that we want to minimize, we want to minimize the difference in energy. So we see that. Uh, as it happened with the force before, we um, uh, reach a more stable situation uh, with the mesh cutoff of around uh, uh, 150 Rigbergs. So the results are for a really uh, simple system and everything behaves uh, well and we have a mesh cutoff that is uh, quite uh, low. But as uh, more complex is our system, and also, for example, if we move to a metallic system, we'll have uh, a higher, uh, we will need a bigger uh, mesh cutoff. For example, here I put some results on uh, a small um, sodium um, cell, where you can see that we could expect to use a bigger uh, mesh cutoff, around uh, 1,000 Rigbergs, but uh, like, the take home message is that you should do that 
for your specific system in order to see uh, which is the proper mesh that you need. So you, we cannot generalize um, for all the systems. But uh, before starting the tutorial, let me mention another thing related with the, with the real space grid that Emilio already mentioned before, but I will try to illustrate in a, another way. So um, Emilio mentioned that sometimes can happen that we set a mesh, but then if we uh, change the atomic positions, the, uh, the results are not stable. So the, basically that we, we don't have a mesh that is invariant under the translation of our uh, atomic coordinates. So um, our goal is to have an, an uh, a mesh that is invariant any, uh, an, under any uh, tr a translation. So we can check if we have this effect by changing the, for example, the origin of these atomic uh, coordinates. So if we do that, for example, for this system that is magnesium oxide, we'll see that if we change a little bit this origin, just a, a portion of the, a sixth of the portion of uh, separation between these two dots, as we shift, we see that the we, we found a difference in energy. So this is known as the egg box effect and can be corrected um, using an increase of the mesh cutoff and also using the grid uh, cell sampling. So uh, you will find uh, a tutorial to, to see that by, our, uh, by yourselves. Um, but you must check that also for your system when you are doing the calculations. So uh, let me uh, give you uh, some time to try to do this uh, tutorial. The tutorial is quite easy. You have uh, all the um, scripts, uh, all the, you have the script prepared, you have the FDF file, but basically we should suggest you to change the um, the value of the mesh cutoff and see which which are the changes. So what I suggest you is to send the same calculation, but um, changing the name of the output each time. So in that way, then you can compare uh, all the um, all the results at the same time. Because if not, if you run the same calculation, changing the parameter, but if you don't change the name of the files, you will overwrite all the things that you have in the in the folder. So let's say 10 minutes and we and then we will be back and we will continue with the reciprocal space grid. So let me continue with the presentation, but before I think there was a last question, uh, if there is any useful toolkits or scripts to converge the mesh, I think that no, but like everyone has uh, each uh, own uh, script in order to converse the um, things that are more useful for uh, their systems. But I think that there is nothing official uh, in the documentation of Siesta, but you can prepare it yourself. It's just changing the parameters. So let's move to the reciprocal space. So um, why it's interesting going to the reciprocal space? No, because before we were talking about uh, methane, so we don't need reciprocal space in that sense, but if instead of um, computing things for uh, molecules, we, are, we have a crystals, you know that we will uh, have to consider an infinite matrix because we will have um, a large system, but lucky for us, uh, it has um, a certain degree of periodicity. And taking advantage of this uh, degree of periodicity, there are some properties that can be computed in the reciprocal space. And the reciprocal space, it's, um, it means that we can reduce our uh, structure, our crystal, our infinite crystal to a, a finite space that it's defined by the, the motive of our uh, periodicity. So we can translate uh, our infinite system to a finite matrix, and there are some properties that are in, 
that can be computed there, like the, um, the density of states of uh, or the banter structure. And you will have a tutorial about that, about how you can visualize and how you can compute them uh, tomorrow morning. But uh, for, from now, we will see how we can uh, discretize this reciprocal space, how we can set the sampling. So in order to set the sampling, as before, we have um, a useful tag in the FDF file, which is uh, kgrid cutoff. Or, uh, in fact, we have two different flags. We can use the kgrid cutoff or the monhorse pack grid, which is the difference between them. In the case of the kgrid cutoff, it works um, quite similar to the mesh cutoff. So in this case, instead of setting um, an energy, we set a distance. And um, from this distance, uh, Siesta will set uh, the mesh. So uh, a Siesta will take this distance and uh, uh, in agreement, in, in accordance with the, the lattice parameters of our system, uh, Siesta will decide uh, how many points it's, uh, are needed in each direction of the system. But uh, we also can use the Monhos pack, as uh, Emilio mentioned this morning, and we can um, just manually set uh, how many points uh, we how many k points we wa will want in the each direction of our system. Additionally, if we use this uh, k-grid monhorse pack block, we can uh, set a shift or not. We can cheat a little bit our uh, our sampling, our mesh, uh, using uh, the third, uh, the fourth column of the block. This is interesting for um, very specific systems that, for example, uh, present a high symmetry or uh, and a special feature at a gamma point, for example, that we will need an, a shift in order to have a proper result, but uh, it's it's uh, really dependent on the system. So basically, we enter this information into the FDF file, and then from there, Siesta will uh, decide all the grids. I Sorry, all the grids, yes, by meaning that uh, it will decide how many K points we will have and which are the position of these K points. So uh, using that, plus the lattice vectors, like and the atomic positions of our structure, Siesta will decide the K points. You can find information in the, uh, the output file that is uh, the your system label dot KP, but also if you um, activate uh, write K points in the FDF files uh, true, you will have also the information in the, out the main output file of Siesta. So in this file, you will know how many points you have. Here it's uh, 22. And then you will have the coordinates of these points in a bors at uh, bors minus one and the weight of each of these uh, game points. And these coordinates are in the, in the units of the reciprocal space lattices, vectors. So uh, how we can decide which is a good value? So it depends on one, what we want to compute. But first, as before, we will look at the total energy of the system. And as you will see just in the next slide, uh, for um, non-metallic systems, we can um, converge that easily. But then uh, maybe we will need to increase it uh, in order to compute the density of states of the band structure. But for metallic system, we will need more K points. Uh, uh, a certain amount, amount of K points. And what happens if we don't set uh, this setting? So the default value for Siesta is zero. So basically, a uh, gamma point calculation will be done. And if we have a crystalline system, probably uh, we will have this output. So Siesta will say to us that we are doing a gamma calculation. So maybe uh, you will have some uh, kind of error in the feature that you are computing. So here you can see on the slide uh, some data for a, a silicon structure. So you can see as a function of the K grid uh, cutoff, uh, how many points are set uh, by Siesta and also uh, how many points we have in, for example, uh, the kx uh, vector uh, direction, 
But in this case, it's silicon, so we will expect to have the same amount in all the directions as is a cubic structure, but that will not be the the not, will, will not be true, for example, if we have graphene, because we will have just uh, K points in the, uh, di in the 2D directions and not in Z. And then if we look at the energy, we will see that easily we can convert the energy just with a small amount of K points. However, in, if instead of having silicon, we have a, a metallic system like, for example, gold, we can see that uh, the energy doesn't convert, converge as fast. Um, and for example, here we would expect to use uh, at least 1,000 K points in order to have some uh, good result. And also we'll have to in, in, uh, improve uh, some other uh, parameters of the calculation. So just, uh, I prepare just a small tutorial for in order to understand how this uh, reciprocal uh, grid, the this K grid is set. Uh, you can find it in in the link that you have on the on the page, and um, it's basically to see how the grid is set for graphene and diamond structure. But after that, you will find a tutorial for the density of states and another one uh, regarding the band structure. But we will not talk about that today. We will talk about that tomorrow. But um, like. After the school, you can continue with the tutorial and you will see which is the effect of the amount of K points that you have in the representation of the density of states or the band structure. So uh, I'll give you now uh, like 10 minutes or a little bit less in order you to try the, to setting the K points and see the difference and finding the things on the output files. Okay, so let's continue with the last part of uh, this hands-on session. Uh, I think that you can be done because the tutorial was quite fast. Uh, if you have uh, more questions regarding it, you can write it down or just say the question or whatever. Uh, so the last part. Uh, finally, let's talk a little bit uh, a little bit about uh, self the um, the conversion of the self consistent cycle. And uh, as um, Emilio mentioned, and you already know, no, in any of these uh, DFT calculations, we do a self consistent cycle in order to converge our calculation and um, basically uh, checking if uh, our uh, density matrix is good enough or not, and if we are done uh, or with our calculation. However, we can decide how this, uh, con this uh, conversion convergence is uh, reached. So we can decide several things in Siesta. Mainly the two main uh, things that we can decide is we, if we want to mix the density metrics or the Hamiltonian metrics, and uh, which is the mixing algorithm that we that Siesta will use in order to do this mixing. There is a, sim a really a simple one that it's linear, but then also you can use a uh, broadening and a uh, pulley, which are based on a, com on a comparison of the matrix that you have in uh, previous steps. So let's see how we can tell that to Siesta uh, once more. Uh, for sure, we have to add these flags into the FDF file. If we don't add it, uh, we, we are lucky because we have a default value, but uh, maybe you are not converging the calculation if in the best way that you can. So uh, the first flag is the scf.mix. Uh, that uh, you decide which which uh, matrix matrix you want to mix, either the density or the Hamiltonian. By default, it's a Hamiltonian, but uh, for example, sometimes it's uh, better to use uh, the density. For example, for systems that are hard to converge. Uh, for the case of the mixer method, uh, the default is the pulley. Uh, it is not recommended to use the linear, but in some occasions can be uh, can happen that you prefer to use linear. But um, if not, use either pole either broad day. 
uh, then you can decide which is the mixer weight. So how amount of the new matrix that is computed you will use the, will use in order to mix with the old one uh, in a simple way. You can understand in this way. So for uh, this value should be between uh, zero and one. So low, um, bigger than zero and lower than one, not included, don't include the extremes. And uh, for a simple system, you can use, for example, uh, 0.4, that it's a system that it's really easy to, easy to converse. So you will be able to reduce the number of steps of the, of the cell consistent cycle. But if you have a system that is hard to convert so that you don't re need to reach the conversions, maybe it's useful to use a really small uh, mixer weight. The default one is the 0 0.25. Other things that you can set is the mixer history. So how many steps before you will take into account in order to do this mixing. Uh, by default is two, but for example, you could decide to have into account for uh, systems that are complicated to converge that you don't reach the conversions. Maybe you want to take into account 10 uh, before the steps, or maybe you don't want to take into account any of the steps. So maybe you prefer to forget about the previous steps. Depends on the system, basically. Uh, also, a thing that it's um, quite um, uh, easy. It's just basically that you can decide which is the maximum of iterations that you uh, want to do before reaching the conversions, because it can be that you will never convert, so you prefer the, your calculation to stop. By default, it's uh, 1,000, so you expect the system to converge at some point, but uh, maybe you prefer to just set a maximum uh, 50 uh, iterations, and that's it. And also, um, you can decide, for example, to deactivate uh, either the density matrix conversions or the Hamiltonian conversions. By default, both of them are uh, activated, but you can deactivate uh, one of them uh, if it's needed. And also, uh, sorry that it's not here in this column, uh, you can set the tolerance uh, in conversions of conversions of the density matrix and also the tolerance uh, of the Hamiltonian uh, uh, conversions. So uh, these are the default values, but you can change it according to the needs of your system. So from this part, uh, my recommend the recommendations that we have for you is basically that you have to study the conversions according to your system. CST offers uh, more advanced options apart from these ones that I show here. In fact, you have uh, another uh, kind of mixing that can be uh, ideal, for example, for your specific system that is charge. And uh, so you can um, have, um, you can alternate different kinds of mixing um, in order to reach the proper conversions. All of these advanced options are um, well explained in the um, Siesta manual. And also you will find an optional tutorial after the one that we will do just now. So you can check it there. You have the FDF file prepared and you will see um, a mix of mixings, uh, of different mixings for a, a specific uh, system. Because as I said, all of these uh, parameters depend strongly on your system. So now I will plot, as I made for the other sections, some results on a simple molecule, but that, that is not what will happen probably with the system that you want to study. So as before, here is the res are the results for the methane. So everything works fine, no? However, not everything was fine. If you see here, I plotted how many iterations I needed to converge uh, the calculation for methane, depending on the mixer weight used. And as you can see, there is a point where the if we use the if we mix the Hamiltonian using the linear method, there is a point where our um, calculation stopped converging. That it's around uh, 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 zero point six. And also it happens um, later for the for the uh, Broadway uh, Broadway uh, method. 
But if we if we use this the second methods, the more complex ones of uh, mixing, we see that the number of iterations needed uh, decreases uh, quite a lot. And the same happen if we uh, try to converge using the density instead of the Hamiltonian. We see we uh, recover more or less the same behavior, behavior but uh, this is just the case for this uh, methane uh, molecule. If we converge, try to converge, uh, sorry, if our calculation does not converge, in our uh, output file, we'll find this tag. So SCF not converge. So you can uh, try to find this one. And additionally, you will find all the errors uh, on the main output of Siesta. But uh, you can check that it's because of the non-conversions of the calculation. And if the conversions is com is if the calculation is converged, you will find this tag in the output of uh, Siesta. But there are uh, other systems that, yeah, that are more uh, complicated to converge. For example, here for sodium, I tried uh, uh, lower values of the mixing as it was quite not as easy as before to converge. But in any case, what is important is that you, which you should check for the system that you are studying. Uh, you have a tutorial prepared for this section where you can see uh, which is the dependent on the converge parameters and the number of iterations and how easy or, or difficult it is to converge it. And uh, before leaving, because then after that, uh, like the workshop is finished uh, for at least uh, this day of the workshop is done. Uh, I just uh, want to uh, summarize a little bit what we have been talking about today. We have uh, initially you, uh, gave you some initial uh, recommendations and tricks in order to start a siesta calculation. So basically, we said that you need the structural data, and then you need to optimize your calculation in different ways. You, we have learned how to optimize the basis set. We have uh, uh, see how is the conversions of the real space grid, how we can convert the reciprocal space grid in the case that we have crystals. And uh, finally, I have talk, been talking about uh, how we can uh, converge the self-consistent cycle mixing. And what will happen tomorrow? Tomorrow we'll talk about more specific uh, problems and applications, and we will uh, also compute some properties and see how we can extract uh, information about our calculations. And I think uh, thank you for your attention, and please try to do the workshop item um, tutorial, and we will answer all the questions that you have. And I don't know if there is any question right now.